Okay, so let's start. Welcome everybody. My name is Patrick Pheasant. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at NIAS Australia and I'm really, really happy you could join us today to talk about uh, benchmarking. Uh, so this is one of our many webinars that we've been running throughout the year um, and as we kind of wrap up towards the end of the year we've got another another couple of webinars uh, that we'll do before the end of the year. So if you've joined us in the past webinars, welcome back. If this is your first uh, NIAS webinar, uh, welcome. It's great to have you and uh, I hope to see you, uh, see you in our future webinars as well. So um, so let's begin. So first of all, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Camaragal, Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Aura Nation on whose land NIAS meets, works, studies and teaches. We pay our respects to elders past and present and extend our respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from all nations of this land. Uh, today's webinar is developing your benchmarking toolbox. And in this webinar, we're going to explore different types of benchmarking and look at how benchmarking is done by NIAS members and also look at uh, what's happening around the sector with different types of benchmarking. Uh, we'll have a, a, a quick chat about the impact of the changes in national standards in 2018. And uh, I'll also introduce you to some great tools that you can use, uh, whether you're endorsed by NIAS, you're a teacher or uh, you're a, a member of another organisation in the sector, all of these tools are available on our website. So I'm going to show you where those tools are and introduce you uh, to them and hopefully uh, you can use them uh, in your organisation. And then uh, we'll look at uh, how you might use some of your benchmarking um, activities to influence your managers and manager. Um, so NIAS uh, has, uh, has transformed um, quite dramatically over the last 12 months, as most organisations have. Uh, we uh, have moved most of our uh, quality assurance activity online. So we've been doing quality assurance visits uh, remotely and uh, all of our professional development activities being delivered online as well. Um, in the last uh, 12 months or so, we have been also offering uh, quality assurance services to education agents uh, and also service uh, providers. So those organisations that are, are offering a product or service to the English language teaching community and uh, most recently we've been endorsing ELT professionals. These are individual teachers or academic managers who are either working at NIAS endorsed centres or who are independent or working at other organisations as well. So we're really, uh, we're offering quality assurance services across the entire community and uh, that's the, the, the angle or the, the kind of um, perspective that I'm taking when I'm presenting about benchmarking. Um, if you're not uh, not NIAS endorsed, um, uh, I invite you to, to check out our website and to have a look at the process for becoming endorsed. Um, it is actually probably the biggest benchmarking activity that you could take. Uh, the quality assurance process is, is actually a, a, a benchmarking process in, a, in and of itself. So if you're interested in benchmarking uh, and you're not endorsed by NIAS, uh, you might want to have a look at their website and, uh, and join our membership. Our quality assurance framework uh, is a very organic framework. We've been developing it for the last uh, 30 years. It changes as the industry changes. And you can see on the left here uh, of the screen, uh, uh, the focus of our quality assurance uh, uh, process is around the student experience and the uh, quality experience for students. We have uh, five core areas uh, which are uh, looked at in uh, the application for uh, endorsement and also our quality review visits which we undertake every two years. On the right are our bolt-on or add-on areas of our quality assurance framework, which our members uh, may choose to uh, be quality assured in, uh, depending on their circumstance, their business model and, uh, and their offerings for international students. All of our standards are available online. You can just go and have a look. And uh, if you're endorsed by us, you can refresh yourself uh, and have a look at some of these new areas that we're endorsing. Uh, or if you're not endorsed by us, you're more than welcome to have a look at those standards and use them as uh, a benchmarking tool for your own uh, organization and your own practice. 
So um, that's a little bit about us. Um, I'd love to hear um, about you. So we're going to uh, put a poll up here and I would love to uh, hear a little bit more about yourself. Uh, if you can choose one of these uh, to uh, identify with today, uh, we've opened the poll. If you can jump right in and choose um, one of these that best uh, describes you currently at this moment. Um, you might be supporting teachers, you might be new to teaching and be an aspirational teacher. Uh, you might have been around the block and, uh, and uh, have, uh, have been in the industry for a while. So if you can let us know which of these um, is most appropriate for you, that'll give me a sense of who's in the room and, uh, and a bit of a needs analysis. Okay, we'll keep the poll open for another couple of seconds. Okay, we will close the poll and um, I'll share the results with you. Um, so that's good to know. Uh, we've got a very large group of, uh, of people in the room who are supporting teachers. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, we've got some aspirational teachers in there. Um, a few, few people have been around the block. Um, great to see there's some, uh, some kind of uh, core teachers or people with a passion for teaching there. They love being in the classroom. So that's, um, that's fantastic. Thank you for coming. And it's great to have you uh, all, uh, all in this webinar. So we'll just move on. Um, bit of a chat call out now. So if you can just kind of jump into the chat room and uh, I'd love uh, for you to just write a couple of words in to describe what activities come to mind when you think of benchmarking. So if you can jump in the panel um, and throw in a couple of words in there, it might be um, validation, moderation, it might be benchmarking, great to external uh, tests. Uh, liaising with other schools and doing some kind of peer peer validation, documenting and tracking. Okay, yeah, we've got some um, some thoughts in there. Uh, yeah, it's all about standards. Uh, that's a big part of benchmarking. Uh, comparing uh, an assessment validation, proficiency levels, uh, test comparisons. Great. Okay, so we've got a bit of a varied view there on uh, on benchmarking. Um, please feel free to shout out to, to each other and say hi and to use the chat room as well. Um, if you uh, have any questions, uh, please throw them into the Q&A. Oh, okay. Thanks, Joel. You just mentioned it's like comparing apples and oranges. Yeah, that's <laughs> sometimes feels like the case, doesn't it? Uh, trying to compare different tests or compare different um, assessment items or compare different schools or different um, syllabuses as well. Okay, good, great. Some good, good views uh, to start. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, if you have any questions, pop them in the Q&A. Uh, we'll stop a couple of times throughout the next hour and I'll try and address your, your questions in situ. Uh, if we can't get to all of the questions, we'll do a follow up with the questions uh, uh, after the, the webinar. Okay, another quick chat call out. So if you can get your fingers ready to do some typing again into the chat room, I'd just like you to choose one of these questions and have a crack at giving me a sentence around answering them. So we've got four questions here. One is, what recent benchmarking activities have you been involved in? Second question, why is benchmarking important? Third question, how can you use benchmarking to influence others? And the fourth one, what advice do you have for someone who's new to benchmarking? So we're just gonna take uh, one minute here. I'm gonna actually time you. I'd just like you to choose one of these questions and please throw one sentence into the chat room as your answer to this chat call out. Over to you. Okay, if you've just joined us, uh, we just have a short task. Uh, we'd just like you to write one brief sentence into the chat, uh, chat box, uh, answering one of these questions. Okay, so we've got, we've got some people in the room with some experience in moderation and validation. Um, someone's suggesting that benchmarking should be done in small chunks and often involving as many stakeholders as possible. Um, we've got uh, someone talking about um, 
uh, looking at future pathway partners, uh, looking specifically at standard P4 in the national standards. Um, someone's mentioned uh, influencing uh, faculties to recognize direct entry pathway programs uh, with articulations with universities. Um, uh, someone's talking about um, looking at, uh, at working from different angles and um, Someone's uh, nominated that you know benchmarking is important because it's about continuous improvement and structure. Great, thank you, thank you for indulging me, and that's uh, great to see we've got some people with some really good experience and uh, some curious people in the room. Awesome. Okay, so just uh, as I said before, NIAS quality assurance is one big benchmarking exercise, and um, just to kind of establish uh, what our definition of quality assurance uh, is. So it's the planned actions that are made by an organization or an individual to provide confidence that its products, its service, its teaching, its syllabus meet quality goals and is focused on continuous improvement and enhancement. And I'm glad to see someone put in the chat room a focus on continuous improvement and enhancement, enhancement because that's, that's the key focus of, of NIAS. Yes, we have a quality assurance process. Uh, yes, we have ongoing uh, activities and quality review visits, but we're really about helping our partners, our members uh, set up systems to be uh, self-sufficient in continuously improving and enhancing what they do. And you know, benchmarking is really at the kind of core of quality assurance. Um, it's the process of measurement against a standard. Uh, for example, you might compare your ELT courses uh, and the outcomes uh, in terms of student performance. You might compare that to a standard, a framework, a requirement, another provider, another partner. It's about measuring something against something else. And that may be apples and oranges, as Joel uh, mentioned, um, but it's you know obviously good if you are benchmarking against something that has an already established credibility and validity and uh, is something that can be an external reference. So it's really hard to do benchmarking by yourself and it's really hard to do quality assurance by yourself. Um, so uh, th this is kind of all about how do you set up multiple ways of, uh, of benchmarking, multiple ways of measuring against a particular standard. And uh, best practice is not just having one benchmarking activity, but having at least three. So you can triangulate the results of those benchmarking activities and you're not solely reliant on just one step or one process. So, um, why is benchmarking important? Well, you know, we, we live in a, a regulated um, community and society. Uh, there are great uh, regulators, Oscar and Texa, who have, uh, you know, the authority in Australia to regulate against our national standards. We are one of the leading um, um, countries in the world with our ELECOS standards that have been in place uh, for, you know, a, a, a long time. Originally, uh, you know, developed uh, uh, by uh, English Australia and NIAS as a partnership and then NIAS has worked over the last 30 years in developing um, um, standards for English language teaching uh, and then from there the regulators uh, over the last 10 years or so have adopted um, the accreditation using um, uh, the national standards. These standards have been reviewed and most recently 2018 and one of the key changes in 2018 was uh, P4 Point one. So this was a, 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 an addition or a, I guess an expansion of one of the components of the standards previously that is uh, really aimed at focusing on helping pathway providers. So um, these uh, programs of English um, for academic purposes or direct entry programs that are articulating into a tertiary uh, education, a tertiary institution must have um, evidence that their assessments are equal uh, to or similar to the assessments required by the university. And I think this was, um, you know, really a, a game changer with um, uh, looking at design of direct entry programs and looking at design of uh, English for academic purposes and those uh, relationships between the higher education provider and the pathway provider or the articulator. 
Now, there was a lot of discussion at the time about what, uh, how this should be measured or how the benchmarking should be done. And, you know, as many of you know, universities have all sorts of entry requirements uh, for English language uh, ability or proficiency. Um, uh, many use, uh, you know, high stakes testing. Uh, some use uh, testing of uh, soft skills and pre-testing for graduate attributes. Others uh, use, uh, you know, a combination thereof. So this, uh, you know, is a really, uh, um, I guess, put, uh, I wouldn't call it a spatter in the works, but certainly uh, uh, changed the way that uh, English language teaching provision is conducted uh, in Australia uh, for those providers that are pathwaying into to universities. NIAS has had a you know, very strong area in moderation and validation uh, you know, in our standards for, for a long time. And we've been doing training uh, to the sector on validation and uh, moderation. And one of our key areas, uh, which is the first quality area A, is around teaching, learning and assessment. One of the key components in that area is about focusing on um, ensuring that uh, you know, the LACOS course is accepted that's accepted for direct entry is benchmarked against the relevant tertiary education admission criteria. And this, uh, this particular standard looks at uh, course design and how the course design supports quality learning outcomes. Uh, it, it looks at how uh, uh, the teachers are trained and recruited and uh, how professional development is conducted with the teachers and what type of moderation and validation activity the teachers are trained in. Um, it also looks at how students are enrolled uh, and how the courses uh, you know, are mapped against uh, levels and benchmarked against uh, you know, external uh, benchmarking tools such as uh, the, the Common European Framework of Reference. Um, it also looks at uh, course delivery, the assessment items, and is the teaching approach uh, optimal uh, for uh, uh, the outcomes for students? And uh, also looks at um, the evaluation of courses to ensure that it's consistent, it's ongoing, and it's rigorous. So these are all, all aspects of, of benchmarking uh, that are important to consider. Um, but I think probably the most important thing about benchmarking is uh, to maintain innovation and competition. You know, by doing benchmarking, especially if you're benchmarking externally to other organisations, they may or may not be competitors or they may be from another country. This is where I think kind of the ideas sharing and the collegiality uh, occurs in, in our industry. And, you know, there's been a number of great benchmarking activities that have been done with multiple um, providers joining in in the benchmarking and you know that's one thing I really I love about the English language teaching community in Australia is we are collegiate we we do want to share uh, what we're doing and uh, share our successes so uh, this is um, you know a really important part of uh, uh, benchmarking and a, and a great outcome of engaging in benchmarking activities with your peers. So what's in your toolbar, tool, uh, what's in your benchmarking toolbox? Um, have a bit of a think. What do you do for benchmarking? What are the multiple things that you, uh, activities that you engage in in your organisation to ensure that you're uh, benchmarking correctly? So have a bit of a think about that. I'm going to suggest, suggest several. We're going to look at some of these and then we're going to kind of move into some discussion. So um, these are some things that might be in your toolbox. Of course, you've got to have a great syllabus, a well-designed uh, set of documents that look at not just uh, you know, what the teachers are going to do in the classes, but what type of assessment items you, you have, the purpose and the, the, the methodology behind the assessment, um, the external referencing that you've done uh, for your assessment items in your syllabus, and of course, you know, uh, guides for teachers on, on how to um, approach and adapt the syllabus for their particular student needs. Um, Assessment tools and outcomes is another element of, of benchmarking. Of course, frameworks and standards and references to those. Using external tests and mapping uh, your own assessment uh, items against those external tests. Uh, tracer studies of student outcomes are, you know, really an important part of benchmarking. And, you know, if you're unable to do that yourself in your own organisation, you might benchmark horizontally uh, with other organisations that have those tracer studies. 
So, you know, it's important to consider, you know, that um, we're following the students as they're coming out of our programs and looking at performance metrics um, to, to show that, you know, we've, we've done some tracer studies to uh, assess the students' um, outcomes. As I mentioned, looking at competitor or peer courses, um, you can always refer to the, the TEXA guidance notes and USCRA has some great resources as well. And the, uh, you know, the other peak bodies in Australia have some great resources too. English Australia has some fantastic stuff around best practice. IEAA has uh, some groups as well focused on assessment. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, resources in, in the sector uh, uh, that you can use for benchmarking ideas. And of course, you can also rely, rely on NIAS as well. So we have health checks. Uh, which are short uh, 15 minute surveys that you can do across all of our quality assurance areas. And this gives you a chance to benchmark your own activity against other NIAS indoor centres. NIAS conducts research as well. We do our own benchmarking. We benchmark NIAS uh, itself against uh, uh, Qualen uh, members. So these are other quality assurance um, uh, agencies around the world. We do benchmarking activities with them to map our standards against their standards. And we also engage external uh, academics to review what NIAS is doing and uh, benchmark our activity against uh, the sector. We have a service, NIAS Assist, where we do independent benchmarking. Uh, this is a, a fee-for-service activity uh, for providers. Uh, you don't need to be NIAS endorsed to do this. And this is a, 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 a series of activities that we can do to uh, benchmark your courses against um, uh, either against uh, uh, equivalencies with tests, against the CEFA, or against the requirements of any of your partner organisations. So uh, this is a, a service uh, that's available to you. And of course, uh, there's some other uh, some other industry research and benchmarking, which I'm, I'm going to refer to. Um, very quickly, um, I think we're all good with curriculum and syllabus documents. Um, I know many people in the room have been teaching for a while, so uh, I'm sure you've seen some great um, syllabuses and been developing uh, some excellent ones yourselves. Um, I, I think just a, a point I'd like to make here, it's a really interesting kind of design concept that you have to consider when you're looking at developing a program. And that's, should you focus on benchmarking through your text and through your syllabus? or should you focus on benchmarking through your teachers? So there's two different approaches to, uh, to curriculum design. You might design uh, in a very kind of text-oriented design, which is about standard, standardization through development of texts. And those texts are where you're getting a sense of benchmarking and you're looking at standardization. Or you might also look at standardization of your teachers to ensure that there's benchmarking occurring between the way the teachers uh, you know, teach the class and the methodologies and approaches that they're using. I advise it's good to do both. You have to look at standardization through your syllabus and through your text and benchmarking that way, but you also have to you know, uh, complement this with looking at ways to standardize and benchmark your teachers because you know no one class is exactly the same no set of students is exactly the same and teachers need to be able to respond and adapt to uh, the needs of the students utilizing the syllabus but you you need to know that teachers are generally kind of aligned and uh, and and doing you know a, a similar thing so you have a sense that the quality is going to be uh, the same so um, that's something to consider at this kind of very base level of benchmarking. Looking at assessment tools and outcomes, and I'm glad kind of Maxine threw a comment into the chat there earlier about, um, you know, it's important to have um, frequent and um, short assessment items. And I 100% I agree with that. Uh, you know, the, I think mainly because of COVID and moving, moving online, uh, uh, online delivery, we've had to look at ways to, you know, um, work around uh, avoiding, uh, you know, having a kind of a very heavy assessment item at the end of the program and all of the issues that go with that when you're trying to do that online. Out of that has emerged uh, this kind of re revised sense of having consistent and ongoing assessment items throughout the program. And I, I know when we come back to face-to-face -face and we're looking at complementing our face-to-face -face, uh, in-classroom experiences with online activity, which I'm sure everyone is going to be doing, uh, I think we can you know, learn from, um, 
from our experience in COVID and implement some of that uh, assessment design uh, into the program to ensure that we are uh, not relying on solely on one piece of assessment. We are uh, mitigating some of the, um, uh, the, the discrepancies that can occur if you rely completely on one piece of assessment. And we're giving opportunities for students to kind of even out some of those um, you know, uh, external factors or extraneous factors that uh, may uh, you know, occur per assessment item. So um, good to hear um, that we're kind of on the same wavelength with that. Um, other things around frameworks and standards. So there's um, a whole bunch of stuff that you can use. You can look at the national minimum standards, which you know are, are designed by the Department of Education, Skills and Employment, and are regulated by USCA and TEXA, all the state bodies. If you're at a high school, uh, you might look at NIAS standards. Uh, you know, we we like to. Um, uh, or we consider these standards aspirational industry-led standards. Uh, this is a framework you can benchmark. You might benchmark against some of the global scales or test equivalencies. You, know, you might use Pearson's or IELTS or TOEFL or Cambridge or OET, whatever's kind of relevant for you. Um, or you might look at uh, more um, um, descriptor-focused benchmarking around utilising the descriptors with um, the, uh, the CEFA. Okay, I'm just going to pop straight into the um, the Q and A, and we'll just have a little kind of touch base with with everybody in the room. We have a question here about uh, there's an increasing focus on formative assessment with a more authentic tasks, which can take an integrated skills approach. What challenges do you think this can bring to benchmarking? Look, good question, and um, you know it. I, my background's in you know using drama to to teach English, and you know in kind of using a drama form like role play in the classroom uh, and, and kind of trying to assess that, assess students, uh, you know, performance or assess students' uh, role play uh, abilities. Um, uh, you know, in this sector, we've been struggling with this question for a very long time. How do you assess these authentic tasks? How do you assess, um, you know, uh, an integrated, um, you know, skills uh, with an assessment item? And look, I think it's all about uh, developing rubrics. It's about looking at, you know, combinations of items in your assessment rubrics that are focused on, you know, the four skills, if that's what you want to include in your assessment rubric. Uh, and you might also focus on, uh, you know, uh, some of the soft skills like, you know, critical thinking, problem solving, uh, and, and so on. So, so there's a lot of um, uh, rubrics that have been created recently around soft skills and certainly around graduate attributes uh, in Australia. Now, this is a really, I think, a burgeoning area of development and research. Uh, universities are focusing on trying to develop, number one, decide what their graduate attributes are. So these are skills that they want their graduates to uh, graduate with after uh, university but looking at kind of trying to retrofit uh, those graduate attributes into their degree programs. And I think a really interesting space for LACOS and for English language teaching is to uh, absorb and adopt some of those graduate attributes into uh, their programs. And of course, this is going to be a question that we need to uh, answer in our pathway programs is how do we assess things like problem solving, critical thinking. And I mean, they're, they're the easy ones. If you look at some of the other graduate attributes that universities have around, you know, tolerance and, and global citizenship and empathy and indigeneity, you've got all these like quite obscure soft skills or attributes that universities uh, want measurements against. And I think Alicos can really be uh, like, can be where the innovation happens because, you know, we, we have, uh, uh, skills around testing, uh, you know, integrated um, uh, skills. We have skills around, uh, you know, uh, assessing students on their, you know, soft skills, their uh, presentation skills. And of course, we, we have skills around uh, assessing intercultural competence and, uh, you know, communication. So I think Helicos is a really fantastic petri dish for developing how we teach graduate attributes to international students and also how we assess that. I don't know if that quite answered your question, Joel, but uh, thanks for thanks for asking. Um, if you have any other questions, just throw them into the, the Q&A and I'll endeavour to, to get to them throughout the presentation. 
Um, another element of uh, benchmarking toolbox is, of course, external tests. And, you know, these are a, a really important part of um, the Australian uh, international education system. Um, they, well, the global global, uh, you know, uh, international education system. Um, they have an important place, an important part to play. Um, you know, we, uh, we have some fantastic um, uh, tests that are available for our, our students uh, to, to utilize. Um, I think what I've noticed from kind of my, I guess, very privileged position of being able to see kind of multiple members doing different things in Australia and internationally, is I think, uh, you know, our kind of uh, general English programs and our test prep programs are, uh, you know, being uh, conducted uh, um, offshore and in country, uh, you know, in a very uh, efficient and cost effective way. And I think, you know, in Australia, if we are to remain competitive with our international um, um, partners, we need to be really rethinking what we do inside our um, English language teaching programs, moving away from the test prep focus uh, and the kind of general English focus. And, and as I said, more on to preparing students for university, but also preempting, uh, uh, you know, preparing students for graduating from university uh, as well. So external tests have a really important part to play, um, but I, you know, I hope that, you know, our focus in LECOS can, can move away from, you know, the high stakes testing uh, training and, 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 and preparation and focus more on utilizing the precious 20 hours that we have with students to be, you know, developing really interesting and um, kind of relevant um, life skills, uh, you know, inside, uh, you know, English language teaching to make them authentic. Um, I've seen providers uh, uh, making greater use of low stakes, low cost tests, uh, lingua skill and Basan are, you know, um, two of them. And uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of um, soft skills testing um, uh, uh, being conducted and some great external tests out there uh, that you might want to look at. One of them, the graduate skills assessment, looks specifically at testing critical thinking, problem solving, interpersonal understandings, uh, as well as written communication. So there's a lot of kind of external tests you can utilize. Um, you can do tracer studies, as I mentioned, and um, you know, I've seen some really creative uh, tracer studies conducted, uh, you know, in, with pathway programs. Uh, you know, if, if you are an English language centre that's, you know, situated inside a university and you have access to the data of your students after they graduate from you into university, I think you're in a very lucky position. The majority of pathway programs and articulation, articulating programs uh, don't have that opportunity to do tracer studies and to follow through their graduates into the university. So if you're in that position, uh, my recommendation, and I've seen this done, is you benchmark against uh, 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 a provider or an organisation that has done tracer studies. And if you can benchmark your assessment items against their assessment items, you have an indirect uh, tracer study uh, um, uh, kind of linkage there that you can certainly draw attention to if you are, are trying to defend your, your benchmarking activity, which of course you need to do when you are uh, regulated. So uh, if you've got a chance to follow students, that's great. If you can't think about how to do tracer studies through partnerships with other providers, um, and yeah, you might also uh, uh, think about, um, you know, doing spot checks on, uh, you know, future students as well. Um, and, you know, I've seen some great stuff done in centres where they are engaging their own graduates with mentoring or with internships or with group research. Uh, so, you know, you can do a, a trace a study without having to actually do it formally. You can follow those students and, you know, have your own small ad hoc tracer study with a relatively small group of students. As long as you're doing with those small groups, you're doing an in-depth study. Um, you know, it, it's quite, quite valid. So a couple of different ways to do tracer studies or to do any type of research. You know, you can use a large group and uh, try and draw conclusions through statistics from a, a much larger group uh, in a lighter way, or you can use a smaller group of students and you can uh, 
uh, do a more qualitative in-depth piece of research or study with them to understand uh, you know, the impact of your uh, assessment items in your program. Um, there's uh, some really great stuff uh, being done with groups around Australia. Uh, so fantastic benchmarking that's uh, been done by the University English Centres of Australia. Uh, I've seen some, uh, some long ongoing uh, benchmarking done between multiple universities. Uh, you know, every year there's an activity where the two universities meet and they do, uh, you know, a, a blind assessment uh, activity uh, or other types of validation and moderation for the assessment activities in their programs. The more you do this, the more consistent uh, you and ongoing you do these types of activities, the more valid and credible they become. Um, so, uh, you know, it's about consistency and about continuing to do things so you can then start to build uh, uh, benchmarking uh, longitudinally. And uh, I think this is something uh, to, to consider. Um, as I mentioned, Tex has got some great resources. So does Asqua uh, and uh, uh, my colleague Cameron will just pop these links into the chat so you can have a look at these. By the way, too, the PowerPoint's available for you and this uh, webinar is recorded, so you can always go back and watch it again if, you, if you've missed something. So what NIAS looks for when we're looking at benchmarking is we look for um, uh, all of these things. And of course, we, we need to collect evidence, uh, so documents essentially, um, uh, that prove benchmarking. So uh, this is also really important to consider. You might have all these great activities you're doing with teachers, uh, you know, to, to validate and moderate the assessment items. You might be following student cohorts uh, and looking at tracer studies, but if you're not documenting it, uh, you've, you've missed the opportunity. And also, you know, you, you've got to be able to prove that you're doing benchmarking. So it's important to keep records. It's important to, to, to document, and you might collect documents in each of these eight areas. So, uh, of course, your syllabus documents, they're kind of one of the key documents NIAS would look at. We'll also look at your assessment policies, your procedures. Uh, we want to see uh, samples of your summative assessment tasks and look at some of your uh, student outputs. So examples of, uh, of student uh, writing or assessment. Um, it's important to have rubrics and, uh, you know, uh, NIAS will look at that as will the, the regulators. Um, it's good to have samples of any moderation or validation activities you've done. Uh, important to keep your templates, your survey results, your meeting minutes, even email correspondence that you're doing. This is all evidence that kind of builds your case for what you're doing uh, from a benchmarking perspective. And uh, certainly if you've got any formal reporting or any formal benchmarking that you've done, um, uh, keep the evidence in the reports, uh, you know, kind of a consolidated place uh, to, to demonstrate that you've been undertaking benchmarking. Um, I'm just looking at the question and answer again. Um, so just a question around, um, do I know of any schools which have done individual tracking uh, LACOS, uh, post LACOS? So for example, case studies to sample the success of students. Uh, yes, yes, there are, uh, um, I've seen a number of schools do this. And, and as I mentioned, you've got, you know, two different approaches to tracer studies and to looking for, uh, for evidence and, and research. One is you might do a wide and varied approach and have a large, subset of students that you're, you're uh, you know, looking at, at, or you might do, you know, one or two or a small group of students, and then you want to look more deeply when you, when you are using this approach. So, you know, it's, it's really about interviewing the students. If you're going to follow, a, you know, one student or two students, it's about interviewing them, being, you know, really clear with the approach that you're taking when you establish the interview questions. It's about documenting their responses, doing some type of analyst, uh, analysis of their response and really presenting what your findings are from that analysis with that one or two students and showing how you're relating that back to uh, the course design or the course redesign. Um, I think this is an equally valid piece of, uh, of benchmarking and piece of research, uh, as long as you're doing it in a, you know, a deep and in interrogative way with that one or two students, 
uh, you know, you can't just kind of touch base with a student and ask a few questions. So your choice, you can take a wide and varied approach uh, or you can take a, you know, a, a small and deep approach. Um, that's up to you. And I think they're both, they're both equally valid. Okay, um, so just uh, kind of how this is all in context with, with NIES, um, and this kind of brings me into kind of this, the second part of this presentation, um, is, um, you know, benchmarking is a, is a continuous ongoing activity. Uh, it, you know, you go through a benchmarking activity when you apply to be endorsed by NIES, but then there's a consistent annual cycle where uh, as part of our uh, quality assurance and benchmarking activity, there's health checks available, there's self-assessment. Uh, we, we of course do the quality review visits and uh, uh, most importantly, we encourage providers to align their professional development with the outcomes of their benchmarking and with our quality assurance framework. So, you know, this is, uh, this is I guess, the other um, um, cornerstone or, or, or pillar of benchmarking is what you do with your teachers and how you train and teach your teachers to, you know, uh, one, partake in the benchmarking activities, but two, partake in course redesign or course improvements or um, service provision improvements based on the research that you got from the benchmarking. Our health checks are, um, as I mentioned, uh, available publicly. Uh, you can do these in an ad hoc way, or these are part of the self-assessment process that NIAS members undertake. Uh, and we have individuals and organisations who aren't endorsed by NIAS utilising these health checks. So you're more than welcome to check them out. Um, by doing these, your data goes into a much larger subset. It's anonymous, but that, that subset is what is then used to uh, benchmark against uh, when, uh, when NIAS providers go through uh, their quality assurance activity. Uh, so, you know, we have a, a very strong correlation with against what's happening in the sector uh, to each of the individual uh, members. And we also correlate between what students are saying and what uh, teachers or management are saying. So that's where our triangulation occurs. Um, the health check is free. It takes about 15 minutes. Uh, you receive a copy by email after you've done it. Um, it can be completed by anybody and it's really can be utilized as a pre self assessment activity. It might be used as a learning tool. Uh, it also might be used as a, a piece of evidence that you've actually benchmarked, uh, you know, uh, uh, your activity against, um, uh, you know, an external referencing system. Um, so just as an example, just to kind of show you kind of the, the data that we're getting through the, the health checks, we started health checking uh, with one of our quality assurance areas uh, online delivery in May 2021. And, uh, you know, we've got four areas in that quality assurance um, space for online delivery. One is design. So, you know, good online design. One is assessment, one is support, and one is reporting and use of reporting. Uh, underneath each of these kind of subheadings, there's, there's, you know, seven or eight drivers for each of these areas. So it's, you know, very detailed uh, health check and detailed area of our quality assurance framework. Um, we, uh, we surveyed um, 111 centres participated, uh, uh, over 200 students participated in this survey. And you can see gaps are generated uh, through the health checks. Uh, and the way we use these gaps is if there's a large gap between what the students are saying, so their sense of satisfaction around each of these areas, if there's a large gap between what the students are saying and what the teachers or the, the academic managers are saying about their programs, that's an area for improvement. That's an identified you know, uh, a space that the, the, the centre can aim to improve. Obviously, if students are saying something that's completely different to, to what the centre is saying, you know, there's a gap there and there's a, a, you know, an opportunity for improvement. If the gap is small, um, this is, you know, a, a identified strength or um, something that the centre is doing really well. So if you look at the gaps here, you can see, you know, there's a, you know, a big gap in assessment. Uh, students are, uh, you know, uh, confused about the assessments. They're unsure of the purpose of the assessment. They're not provided um, templates or rubrics enough. They're unclear about the expectations. So their, you know, their sense of satisfaction is, is there's a strong gap between, you know, them and, and what the centre is saying. 
Uh, if you fast forward this, oh, and reporting as well is also, you know, a, a big gap as well. If you fast forward this to um, May this year, so this is, you know, a continuation of the benchmarking and this survey over 12 months, uh, you can see, you know, there's many more centres that have participated in, uh, in the health check uh, and, and many more students. Uh, and you can see that there's, you know, a, a big difference between the expectations of the students and, um, and the delivery of the online, their perception of online delivery, uh, you know, a, a smaller difference between uh, what they're saying and what the centre is saying. So that, that gap has uh, decreased, which means we're doing things better. We're, you know, students have got used to online delivery, teachers have got used to online delivery, and, uh, you know, our performance is better. Um, but interestingly, you'll note the expectation. So the expectations of students, uh, the, the gap has now increased. And I, I think this is a, you know, really interesting uh, phenomenon that's come out of online delivery. Um, students expect more now. Um, you can't just use Zoom and kind of get away with a, you know, a, a replication of your textbook in a PDF format. You've got to really look for creative ways to engage students if you're going to continue to do things online. So this type of benchmarking is what we do with all of our health checks and I encourage you to participate in them or pass them on to people uh, or your teachers and staff to, uh, to do if you haven't done already. Um, NIAS, uh, NIAS also benchmarks itself because you know, th this is you know, the, the way that you do benchmarking, you, and this would be your case as a centre as well, you would benchmark your kind of assessment items, you would benchmark your course and your syllabus, you'd benchmark your teachers and your, your professional development, uh, and then you'd, you'd look at a much kind of higher level of benchmarking, try and benchmark your centre. This might be your student services areas, uh, it might be the way that you do recruiting, it might be your HR, it might be um, uh, your staff satisfaction you'd look at benchmarking this with other like for like as well. So, you know, by doing this, you're, you're benchmarking um, oranges for oranges and apples for apples, and you're building a kind of full picture, a holistic picture of the organization. NIAS does this as well. As I mentioned, we benchmark ourselves against Quailin, other QA agencies around the world, but we also engage in research to benchmark, uh, you know, ourselves against an external uh, validator or external academic. Um, we did a piece of benchmarking um, a couple of years ago, just before COVID, uh, and we looked at an independent review trying to map uh, the changes in the sector and the activities and events in the sector uh, over the last, uh, you know, uh, uh, six or seven years and how NIAS uh, has changed or adapted to those changes and how our reports, which is one uh, piece of evidence that you know the organisation produces, how all of our reports to our centres uh, have uh, have changed, and what are the what are the kind of you know interesting trends and and observations through those reports, and how they're connected to the events uh, in the sector. What we found uh, was that you know assessment validation and moderation has been improving dramatically across the sector. So that's great. It's fantastic to know. Um, we also found that um, teacher qualifications and professional development has been strengthening. Uh, in the past, there's been a sense of minimum qualifications and then no real kind of uh, overview or uh, focus from, um, from English language teaching centres on, you know, continuous professional development at the various stages or cycle of the teacher um, uh, professional development. So that's changing, which is fantastic. Um, there is, uh, you know, very structured approach to curriculum reviews rather than it being ad hoc. So that's a, another fantastic finding. Um, uh, there's been really uh, major changes in, and improvements over uh, support for under 18s. Uh, so that's uh, very positive to see. Uh, and uh, some really interesting findings around professionalization of English language teaching and especially uh, benchmarking and professional development uh, for academic managers. And I think, uh, you know, this is a, a watch this space for our sector. Uh, what do we provide to our academic managers uh, with regards to benchmarking? How do we bench 
uh, and, and develop performance metrics of our academic managers in English language teaching. I think this is a, a great space for, for new work uh, in, in benchmarking in Australia. Um, there's, uh, you know, uh, typically in the past, uh, you know, admissions and support staff uh, you know, have, have felt quite removed from the provision of the uh, English language teaching and that's changing and, you know, uh, it's a much more holistic approach to influencing curriculum design and program design, which is good to see. Um, so some kind of key findings there which, uh, you know, uh, talk to the sector and the changes in the sector and, uh, you know, the reflections and responses that NIAS has made, uh, you know, over the years. Um, I just want to kind of talk briefly to, you know, a great piece of, uh, of research that was done and benchmarking by IWECA, by the University English uh, Language Centres of Australia. Um, you know, this was a, a brilliant piece of, uh, of benchmarking. You can look online and, uh, and read this if you like. You know, it, was, it looked at 21 uh, uh, University English Language Centres across Australia, uh, developing uh, uh, an external referencing point for uh, looking at review of assessment processes and policies, and also review of monitoring and tracking of continual improvement in direct entry programs. Um, and also looking at uh, benchmarking, written assessment and outcomes across direct entry programs. Uh, if you haven't read it, it's a great piece of research. A couple of key findings that have come out of there around, uh, you know, uh, finding that, you know, the internal processes and policies for moderating assessment are really rigorous across uh, the AWECA participants or institutions. And also there's um, some really good monitoring and tracking for um, students enrollment period, uh, you know, uh, across the Alicos uh, direct entry programs. A whole bunch of other uh, data in there, which I, I think is good to, to look at. And if you're not, uh, you know, a, an AWECA member and you're not a University English Language Centre, I do encourage you to reach out to NIAS. There's opportunity to do uh, uh, collaborative research like this. Uh, so if you are interested in participating in these types of, uh, you know, cross uh, institution uh, more wide uh, uh, benchmarking projects. Uh, we'd love to have you involved and uh, be happy to kind of give you some more information about that. Okay. Um, I've got some questions along the way, but I, I, does anyone have any uh, questions I'd like to throw into the, the Q&A? Um, if you can throw one in, uh, that would be great. I'm happy to, to answer those. Um, while you're thinking about what those questions might be, I just uh, want to draw your attention to some upcoming activities uh, with NIAS. So next week on Friday, we have our second workshop series uh, for our Vietnam um, activity. We've been running a series of workshops um, designed to share the experiences of Australian uh, providers with um, our university and um, uh, um, English language teaching centres in Vietnam. Uh, we conducted the first one uh, uh, a month ago. It was really fantastic. There's a whole bunch of presentations that you can watch before the workshop and then the live workshop uh, next Friday ha has a panel and we have different uh, participants uh, talking to their experience uh, with uh, online delivery and also teacher professional development. So please, please join that. I'd love to, uh, to see you in the in the, 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 the webinar next week. Um, we have also started to uh, uh, release information about our conference next year. We'll be running it um, kind of off the back of our successful conference this year. It was a hybrid model. Uh, it was conducted face-to-face -face at Dalton House in Sydney and also stream, uh, stream live uh, into a virtual platform. Uh, we'll be doing the same model next year. Uh, we've secured some great speakers uh, already for the conference uh, and we have the first release of tickets uh, ending um, uh, towards the end of November. Uh, so there's still time to, to jump in and uh, uh, take advantage of those uh, low cost uh, tickets uh, in the first release. Um, just a bit of information about our micro-credentialing and badges. Um, check out our website, uh, the ELT Professionals uh, section. Uh, we have a number of different badges which you can uh, either do yourself or you can encourage your teachers to, to do. Um, and uh, of course, we have our capstone uh, course, which is the Master Practitioner in ELT. Uh, we have a number of, uh, of uh, 
people who have you know, undertaken this endeavor and have been awarded the endorsed ELT professional uh, mark. Uh, this is a you know, credential that you can use and post on LinkedIn uh, and uh, you utilize on your resume uh, and you also get publicly listed and acknowledged as having achieved uh, uh, this uh, capstone course. Um, it's a, a research based um, program. So if you've got uh, a great activity or project that you've been undertaking uh, or would like to undertake uh, uh, that you can do in your centre that showcases your understanding of the NIAS quality assurance framework and demonstrates how you've been taking some of these elements. You might choose something like benchmarking, for example. Um, you, uh, you set up a project, uh, you let us know what the project is, and then we support you through that uh, to produce either a report or a, um, a presentation or a workshop or a creative expressionist dance, it's up to you. Um, the outcome uh, is up to you. You can choose uh, what you'd like to produce um, and we support you through that process. So I'd love for you to, uh, to consider doing the Master Practitioner if you uh, haven't done it already. Um, just a note on the certificates and CPD points. Um, uh, after this uh, webinar, you'll receive a link uh, by email and that's how you print your certificates and uh, and uh, tally up your CPD points. Uh, that goes into our system and then we have a CPD point leaderboard uh, on our website so you can see uh, uh, what, uh, what CPD points other ELT professionals are gaining and you can also be acknowledged and rewarded for your own endeavours in your own professional development. So um, check that out if you haven't already. Um, a couple more webinars before the end of the year. would love for you to join. Um, I'm doing one on, um, we've got next week, uh, and then on November 10th, uh, looking at improving the student orientation. This is a, a great webinar for uh, either for academic managers, but um, mostly for uh, professional and support staff, uh, looking at, you know, ways uh, that we've seen uh, NIAS endorsed members uh, tweak and customise and innovate their orientation programs. And then uh, the last webinar for the year is looking at planning professional development and uh, I'll be talking to uh, creative ways to design your professional de development programs for your teachers. Um, so you can register for any of these webinars through the link that Cam's just put in the chat. And um, Please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, always uh, happy to e either get a call from you or an email. If you've got any questions around benchmarking or you want me to uh, point you in the right direction, I'd be happy to. Um, thank you for joining everyone. We're going to uh, flash a quick uh, survey up. If you can uh, either QR code this or uh, follow the link that my colleague uh, has put into the chat room uh, and please complete our survey. We take your feedback very seriously as part of our own benchmarking activity. Uh, if you can let us know how we go and if you've got any great ideas for webinars for next year, um, pop it into the survey. We'd be um, delighted to hear your ideas. Well, that brings us to the end of uh, today's webinar. Um, thank you so much for joining me and giving me uh, an hour of your time. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, wish you the very best with your benchmarking activities and also uh, for the rest of 2021. We're almost, we're almost at the end. Um, see you soon. Thank you. Bye now.